Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the session on tech in the global public interest. Uh, I am Ramesh Raskar, professor at uh, MIT, uh, and we're delighted to have some wonderful panelists. And we're going to discuss how mass use technology can have unintended consequences, but more importantly, what can we do to increase the likelihood for a positive social impact because of such technologies. So I'll let some of our, I'll let our panelists introduce themselves uh, for a minute or so, and then we'll jump into this conversation. Uh, Satya, let's start with you. Uh, thanks very much, Ramesh, and hello everyone and welcome wherever you are in the world. Uh, delighted to be here. My name is Satya Bratadas. I lead the Center of Excellence on Human-Centered Digital Economy at a think-and-do tank in Washington, D.C. called The Digital Economist. Now, The Digital Economist is a global impact organization. We are perhaps the largest tokenomics firm in the world. And in terms of thought leadership uh, at the Center of Excellence, our current focus is on the existential crisis of climate change. And technology is very much a part of the solution. So once again, in terms of tech and the global public interest, uh, we want to absolutely be in the vanguard of thought leadership and decision making. And this is a wonderful chance to hear about all the positive benefits that technology can in fact bring. Fantastic. Back to you, Ramesh. Pearly. Wonderful to have you, Pearly. Let's... Hello, Ramesh. Hello, fellow panelists, and hello to the audience. I'm happy to be here and see you all. I'm Pearly from HTC. HTC is a Taiwan-based global technology company, um, a leading brand in building the future of virtual augmented reality and spatial technologies that benefit the society. Um, and I, in, in my long tenure at HTC now, nine years, even before we pivoted into uh, immersive technologies, uh, I've played several leadership strategic roles in the company. These days, I spend most of my time um, investing in founders, building profound um, applications of immersive technology. So when you hear a lot about the hype in the news these days about the metaverse, well, what does that mean? Um, I look forward to, for, to an opportunity to discuss some of these um, with you. And whether that means dystopia or utopia, whether that means endless possibilities or endless nightmare, um, there's a lot of room for imagination. Um, but, but I think one thing I would love for you to take away with is, is this. It is, there's a reason for all of us, each of us in the world, to care about this technology because it is about to impact every aspect of the way we live, work, connect with one another, and play. It will be the scale of a smartphone type technology that touches billions of people's lives globally. If you're still thinking that it's a console-like entertainment uh, device for your living room and for geeks and computer uh, early enthusiasts, um, think again. Uh, there are already a lot of profound uh, applications of this technology that's already saving lives, improving lives. Lives, um, in a way that it was not never possible before. And so I look forward to very much to an opportunity to discuss a lot of these benefits and what, what might be some of the concerns that people have about this future. Wonderful. Metaverse for something more than dancing cats. Uh, John Paul, go ahead. So hi, I'm John Paul. I'm the CEO of Rapid Space. Rapid Space is a company which does something we call fully open cloud and which is a cloud and edge, which is open source, uses open hardware, and which is open process. We usually say that everybody's free to copy our software, copy our hardware, and copy the service we provide. Uh, one of the services we provide is a 5G private network based on a 5G base station, which we actually produce and which is itself open source hardware. And we believe uh, our key contribution to the future is to remove um, any doubts or fear related to privacy or anything people are afraid of related to cloud or 5G by being radically transparent. And uh, I hope we can discuss the interest of radical transparency uh, in this conversation. Uh, Jopal, where are you based? We are based in Paris, but we also have uh, data centers in Japan, in uh, mainland China, in Taiwan, in Germany, Bulgaria, and many countries. 
about 240 uh, point of presence. Fantastic. Uh, Sly, welcome. Hey, Ramesh, good to see you again. And same with you, Pearly. We'll see you uh, in next week as well at South by Southwest for our panel. Um, I'm Sly Spencer Lee. I'm a co-founder and co-CEO of Emerge, a Los Angeles-based tech startup working on creating a platform to understand our emotions and share them across large distances in time by first allowing for the sense of touch virtually. And when we, saw, when we started the company, we wanted to create a new dimension for real-time communication across distance in digital formats. And we thought that the sense of touch was sort of the next key stepwise transformation in how we connect across distance. Touch in VR and the metaverse has been a holy grail for 40 years. We do that by a, a very different approach, as you can see behind me, by a non-wearable. So the device creates literally a force field using ultrasound waves. We can shape those ultrasound waves in three dimensions to allow you to feel volumetric objects that are not physically there. And the key use case here is in social presence, the, the ability to feel more connected with someone you care about and play games together. So everything that's happening today within the metaverse, within VR, um, is directly applicable to what we've been building for now over six years. And we're pretty excited now because we're, we're finally at the stage we're getting the product out to people in the world. And now we're starting to ask some of the really hard questions and starting to build some of the key aspects that we'll discuss today in this panel, such as ethics, the ability for technology for good or not so good. Thanks for having me here. Fascinating, fascinating technology there. Uh, Andrea, welcome. Hello, everyone. Um, nice meeting you. Uh, I'm Andrea Mondi. I'm based in um, I'm based in Singapore. Now it's 10 a.m. on a Saturday. It's usually two years ago, I wouldn't have thought that I was I would be on a, on a web panel at 10 a.m. in the morning <laughs> on a Saturday. It's a, <laughs> it's a new things happening every day now. And uh, I've been in I've been in, I'm, I'm Italian. I've been in Singapore for the past 20 years. And uh, what we do, we have um, I have two I have two hats. In uh, my day job, um, we work with uh, Italian companies, mostly Italian companies, and we have them um, we have to help them develop the business in uh, Southeast Asia. And uh, at night, uh, we we work with startups, mostly European startups, and uh, and we help them um, scale in um, scale in Asia. That's either giving them access to market. Or, um, or giving them access to investors uh, or, um, or resources to help them develop a product. And uh, it's been, uh, I mean, it's very interesting because um, being in Singapore, we are very much at the, at the intersection between, uh, between Asia and uh, Euro Europe, especially when it comes to, um, to new technologies. And uh, so we are able to, we're able to see things happening a bit earlier than, um, than in other places. And uh, I think that the, um, I think the theme of the the theme of the conference this this year is very interesting because it's uh, every technology can have um, as we know can have bad uh, or good uh, good good effect on uh, on society. And I think uh, you know, I think the role of uh, the role of everyone should be try to try to make technology a positive force for society and not uh, and not a negative. As we are seeing, for instance, right now in the Ukraine. Uh, the Ukraine crisis, how how crypto and uh, and satellite technology can help uh, can can help uh, everyday people in um, in difficult situations. Thank you, thank you for sharing that. So this session is about tech in the global public interest. Uh, as I said I'm a professor uh, at MIT. Uh, a lot of my research is on AI for social good. I started a team at Facebook a few years ago. On, on AI for good and also spend time uh, at Oculus. And at MIT, I run a group called Emerging Worlds, where we look at how emerging technology can be used for in sectors like health and sustainability uh, and, and, and so on. Um, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll change the conversation back to you and ask the first question, which is what is some mass use technology that can have unintended negative consequences going forward? Uh, and and Pearly, you're talking about metaverse. So let's start with you. 
as an optimist, I think it's uh, it, it's it, I, I always see all the possibilities um, and always wish that this vision that we all share would come sooner than later. But understandably, there's a lot of a negative imagination of what the metaverse could bring. Right. Um, sci fi authors have long imagined, long inspired our imagination of a world where the real world is crumbling uh, and, and all of us just live within our digital worlds um, uh, in oblivion. <laughs> and, and hopefully that that dystopian future uh, does not need to be true for us to really learn insights from what the possibilities are in these immersive, connected worlds where people uh, have endless possibilities to explore, unleash their imagination, um, do all the things that they cannot do in real life, but also be all the things that they, they possibly can be in real life, right? Famously from the Ready Player One novel, they, people come to the oasis to do all the things they want to do, but they stay for all the things that they can be. Again, that might be a little dystopian, you have your eyebrows raised, but a lot of ways that we see immersive technologies being used f for for good uh, are in obvious ways. We are very three dimensional uh, cent central beings. So in a spatial environment where you are not peeking into your digital information experiences through a two D screen is naturally a lot more um, a lot more real to you. So there's a sense of presence. Your brain is tricked to believe that you are there. And what that brings is not only the ability to co-create memories with people that you care about or, or people from long distances away, but also the ability to create things more naturally and easily. Natural interactions, um, the lowered barrier, not just technical barrier, but potentially creative barriers for everyone to create things, worlds, and engage in their products, productive activities. Um, other aspects include storytelling. It, when we can be walking in someone's shoes and experience uh, a narrative and an important event um, that matters to society in first person view, that, it, that, that becomes much more impactful and visceral and everyone feels more uh, of a conviction to be a problem solver versus not. Then, of course, there are obvious ways in simulation where people can learn much better, much higher retention, engagement, interest rate, but also learning outcome. And then during the pandemic, where we have all been very physically isolated, we see how immersive technologies have played a very, very important role in creating that sense of togetherness as well, beyond the video calls that we're all having today. So that's just a thought starter. We're happy to go in more. I want to highlight something, Pearly, you mentioned on the sense of presence. I think that obviously in the metaverse, you know, that all eyes are trained on this topic in Web3 now. And that's, I totally agree that what's happening now within the metaverse is increased presence. And when you have increased presence, it feels more real. The stakes are higher. So I think yeah. the leap that we went from Web 1.0 to Web 2.0 is very different than the leap we're, we are undergoing now from Web 2 to Web 3 and 2D interfaces from 3 to 3D interfaces. There's, there's things that are happening and we're seeing it every day as we test with users, with our, with our technology, there's this chasm that is crossed whenever you feel like you're actually there where you can elicit a very strong emotional response Absolutely. with our technology. We enable the sense of touch, which is extremely powerful and extremely intimate. And it can elicit very strong emotional reactions depending on who you're talking to, you know, someone you really deeply care about or someone you really don't want to talk to. And so I think that these conversations happening now, like this panel is really important because the stakes are so much higher now when we think about fully immersive presence. And if we worry about data, privacy, uh, information, mm. the safety of, of kids and teenagers, their well-being in Web 2, Web 3, as you say, stakes are much higher. So one of the natural unintended negative consequences uh, associated with this future could be, could be that, an addiction to experiences, a collection of uh, data, enormous amount of data uh, when it comes to 3D and immersive and when 5G and Edge come into play and what, what all that can, can do. And so so I think the the short if jumping to conclusion would be how we we should all um, strive to live up to our highest ideals ideals as new technology creators in creating the the maximum positive impact in everything we do in design um, the system the infrastructure the way we handle and collect data how Web three 
and blockchain technologies would play a role in enabling the users to have full ownership of their assets, but also data. I would love. To, I want to come back to you in a few minutes of talking about how technologies like Metaverse and Web three can be used beyond what they're being intended to be used for in the beginning, which is mainly entertainment or cryptocurrencies and digital assets, and if they can impact fields like you know, health and climate and livelihoods Absolutely. and so on. But before I come back to you, let me go to John Paul because he's working on 5G, which is in a way an, an, one of the enabling technologies for this kind of experiences. So John Paul, technology yes, for global public interest, what are some unintended we've, consequences? We've seen actually uh, with some cases we studied, for example, in Industry 4.0 factories, that 5G is absolutely essential to implement the kind of guaranteed low latency for virtual presence or teleoperation of robots. We actually work with a company that does open source robots for telepresence. And they just told us with Wi-Fi, it doesn't work because uh, we cannot predict uh, problems of interference or congestion. And this also goes to the regulation there are countries, for example, like Germany, where you can get frequencies for your private 5G networks, and countries like mainland China, where it's impossible. And we see that the regulation framework is very important. If we want to enable 5G, if we want to be able to purchase online a base station, as what we are offering, and enable the low latency, we need the proper regulatory framework, which gives the freedom to everybody to put their base station and start doing a uh, presence. And uh, I think wrong laws might lead to wrong uh, solutions. Good laws will enable good 5G. Fascinating. What are some unintended consequences of 5G? Do you think, you know, the, the speed, the, the edge computing, is that going to disrupt certain things, uh, livelihood, businesses, and so on? I, I think the, intended, the biggest unintended consequence is that when you see how 5G is made more and more, it is implemented as software-defined radio or virtual radio access networks, which means there's a PC in each base station or very close to each base station. And it means you can, for example, offload processing of robot behavior directly in the base station. That was not really the case in previous networks. So you get actually more computing power next to where people are manipulating the robot or virtually touching things. So I would say edge is a kind of unexpected consequence of 5G because the way most 5G is made nowadays. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, uh, Satya, let's, uh, let's, let's hear from you about technology for global public interest. Uh, you need to unmute. Okay, my, my honor. Uh, thanks very much, Ramesh and colleagues. What a fascinating discussion so far. I want to come back to the point that Andrea made in the introductory comments about the fact that technology is just a tool. Every technology that humans have invented since the advent of civilization has had negative and positive consequences, and it's no different from uh, the same surveillance technologies that can be used to ensure public safety can also be used in an impressive manner to control people. So really, technology in the global public interest must demonstrably and consciously follow moral and ethical principles. More precisely, when we harness technology to ensure that it's serving economic justice, social justice, inclusive societal development, and above all, when, as Jean-Paul has done with his open source and open platforms, make the technology available to everyone to use, we can really harness it to meet the overwhelming crisis of anthropogenic climate change. So when you look at unintended consequences, yes, they are possible, but you look at the intentionality of the user, you look at the intention of the application, would you necessarily trust uh, Vladimir Putin to use technology responsibly? Perhaps not. So it really depends very much on who is using it and what the application is. And I am not a designer by any means, but I'm sure that designers will 
address themselves to the whole issue of strong sustainability and ethical design. So the design itself is human centered and does not lend itself easily to abuse. So I'll stop there. We have a few other interesting points, I'm sure. Yeah, we're talking about responsible innovation and your point about making that part of the design uh, is very critical. Uh, Andrea, please uh, please t- tell us uh, what you think about uh, technology in the general public interest. I mean, there's, um, it's interesting what Jean-Paul said about um, the um, about the um, about how much um, the jurisdiction and how how they are implement how innovations are implemented at the jurisdictional level impact the development. And uh, sometimes they might um, they might stifle the development, like you said in China, where you can't access certain features of uh, or five five G. But um, what is more interesting is what happens sometimes at the edge of innovation. How how technologies which were um, were, were thought for a certain use, uh, then they they develop into uses that no, nobody would imagine. In and I'm, I'm, I'm talking in the in the in a good way. Think about uh, when uh, mobile phones uh, for GSM first launched. Uh, there was a feature that was SMS. That was uh, that was thought just to be a just to be a, um, just to be a feature to be able to control the the status of a network. And basically, uh, the SMS became messaging, and now we use messaging every day. And I would have thought that 25 years ago, in, instead of using our phones to to call people. We use it to message people. So, so right now, I think most of us we use our phone more to message than to talk, and um, it's something that um, I don't think anybody would have thought. Or oh, think about the internet. When it started, it was just uh, just a network for researchers, and it was uh, and and it was also and basically it was a closed network. Nobody could access it for a, for a number of reasons because of technological technological issues because of, of regulations. For instance, in Italy, the internet was reserved only to research institutions. If you were a normal citizen, te- technically you couldn't access to it. The moment it was um, the moment it was it was open to everybody, we got a number of innovation that again led us to, to be together today in uh, on a video call on an on a normal on a normal computer that 20 years ago would have thought it would be impossible. Not me. I mean, me, me probably yes I'm, I'm a tech optimist, but most people wouldn't have been. So my, my conclusion is, is that usually in, <clears throat> innovation lead to to good outcomes. In the in the process, there might be some uh, some people some people that have uh, that lose their jobs or or lose opportunities. But in that case, it's is a role of the is a role of the state or the government to help them uh, help them catch up and and requalify. But in general, innovations I think are are good for the public. You know, innovation and tech is good for the public interest. Then it's uh, then there are consequences that, that might not be desirable, but at the stage is uh, is a role of the government or the individuals try to try to correct them and address them. Fascinating, uh, Chris. Welcome, and uh, just make sure you introduce yourself for a minute. And we are talking about responsible innovation. Okay. Um, sorry, everyone. Uh, Technology and the global interest. I had a technology issue here, so apologize. Um, <laughs> Not to your interest. My uh, <laughs> my life, my story, I guess, is uh, shaped by um, uh, some three different roles, very different experiences, entrepreneurial type roles. I worked for a very large multinational company um, for most of my career, uh, and then joined a large, uh, large privately owned investment company headquartered in, in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Um, currently, I'm CEO of a new uh, technology company uh, that is uh, Accessible MRI. Um, I have a background in market development, financial analysis, marketing, 25-year-plus um, experience leading uh, complex projects. Um, most of my career, I was with uh, Marriott International as a senior vice president of uh, development. Um, and then, uh, like I said, I worked for a global investment company, Kuala Lumpur, and uh, most recently worked on a, a large city scale development project. Um, and uh, so currently um, I'm, I'm CEO and co-founder of a med tech company um, that will make clinical MRI accessible anywhere in the world. MRI scanners are, are very large, complex devices that are expensive to purchase, 
transport site maintain and support. Um, our technology uh, makes uh, MRI accessible um, and uh, we also have a, a, fun, a radiology support. So everything is, if, uh, is radiologists are off site. Um, we've got a real interesting team, uh, includes scientists at Columbia University, Yale University and Harvard. Um, and we've got uh, software engineers, data scientists, patent attorney, um, and some really good strategic partners. Um, so, um, yeah, currently 70% of the world's population does not have access to MRI. Um, and it is the best way to see what's happening uh, inside a, a, a person. So um, in terms of medical imaging, it's the safest, it's the most effective. And, you know, with what we're doing, we can bring the cost of a scan and diagnosis down to $150 in the U.S. and less in other parts of the world, you know, compared to 2600 uh, which is U.S. standard. So um, that's our technology, um, you know, for uh, in the global public interest, uh, a, a, a new approach to healthcare, care, which, um, you know, could be real exciting and uh, benefit a lot of people worldwide. That's wonderful to hear, you know, highly accessible, democratized MRI and slides working on ultrasound in a very unique way, not for medical imaging, but to create uh, unique interfaces. So let's go back to let's go back to uh, Pearly and Sly. And we were chatting earlier about things like Metaverse and Web3 and how can they be used for, you know, societal applications in areas that, that go beyond cryptocurrencies or digital assets and so on. What, is, what are your thoughts there? Taking the cues from what Chris just said about medical imaging, um, one of my favorite use cases in the portfolio company that we invested early on is called Surgical Theater. Its technology is able to convert all the MRI, CT scan images into a three-dimensional environment unique to the patient's anatomy. So what that enables is not just for the surgeons to plan meticulously in three-dimensional way to increase the success rate of an operation, oftentimes really high-stake operation of the brain, of the heart, but also it creates a bridge of communication for helping patients and their families to understand precisely what is going to happen to them, what is otherwise a very nerve-wracking and, and horrifying experience. So that is just really one small example of how 3D can bring new ways of learning, being productive, providing service to society, and communicating with one another, taking care of emotions and understanding. Um, this is one of the more profound use cases that I really um, feel inspired by. In the same realm in healthcare space, there are plenty of ways how immersive technologies can be used for direct patient engagement and therapeutics. For older adults that are often living in isolation these days, going into virtual worlds or experiences with their loved ones that are not next to them could be a completely life-changing experience, but also good for memory care, reminiscence therapy. Um, and for physical therapies, pain management, even eye treatment, a, a, an array of different ways of direct patient impact can already be achieved today by many founders with these bold and love and kind visions for how these technologies can be used directly to impact lives. Um, elsewhere, um, another company, portfolio company of ours is called VR Chat, where um, uh, thousands of creators around the world go in and create worlds out of their imagination and provide playgrounds for people of all walks of life and interest to come together and engage in a way that was possibly not possible before. And with different uh, technology capabilities like full body tracking, eye tracking, facial tracking, people can have very realistic interaction um, and co-create memories in a spatial way that is not possible via a video screen. And what that means and got me thinking when you talk about remission about livelihood in the future is that in the future, people could be engaged in productivity and activities like building virtual worlds, building virtual goods, um, and 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 literally living and interacting and working inside these environments. Not to say that 
we are leaving our real world behind because what I really find after having been using these technologies daily for an extended period of time is that everything that you experience in the virtual world, no matter how amazing, mind blowing it is, you come back to the real world. These memories help you to appreciate your physical reality and your real experiences with real person interaction that much more. And so um, these are the two of the examples I like to bring to the table. That's, I think that's wonderful. Go ahead, Sly. I would add to that to say, I would reframe the question a little bit. When, if we were talking about VR and AR, the appropriate question would be what you posed, which is what are the different use cases we're seeing evolve? The metaverse is very different. The metaverse is a paradigm shift in how companies, people are already engaging. And there's no good definition even of the metaverse because it's just an evolution of how we are living today. Kids today, they don't hang out on Facebook. They don't hang out on MSN Messenger. They're hanging out in Roblox. So what is Roblox? What's a manifestation of a potent, of one metaverse world or platform or game or whatever you want to call it? And we don't... I think it's really interesting because we're not trying to fight for use cases anymore or fight for why immersive technology is useful. It's already happening. And the term metaverse was applied to try to be the all encompassing framework to describe a set of behaviors and patterns that are being seen. So I think the more interesting question would be, what are the different use cases within particular interfaces or technology platforms within the metaverse and probably describe a number of them in VR. Um, and there's going to be many more interfaces. In if, I, if I can, if I can, if I can uh, challenge sure. you a little bit there, right? I think the point that the point that uh, the virtual worlds allow you to do all these things could also become, you know, an isolating or at least a disembodied experience. Uh, to some extent, your company is looking at a physical uh, augmentation through touch through ultrasound and, and so on. So mm. it feels like you and your company actually have an opportunity to take it away from a purely virtual experience mm. and be attached to something real. Um, yeah. So don't you think there's a, there's, a, there's a risk, but there's maybe something that you can do about it? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point, Ramesh, in that, as Pearly mentioned, there's, there's been so much sci-fi. I'm a huge sci-fi nerd. There's been many great books and novels written and then, then eventually translated to movies of what could be a dystopia or utopia. And typically that happens at a very far extreme of pure isolation, the matrix, right? You unplug or plug in and you're, you have this new reality. I think rea the, the true reality will be actually much more blurred and it will be a mix between what is physical and what is virtual. Look at what we're doing today. Like we, we are in a mini metaverse today, a baby metaverse. You're, you're just inter you're just inter engaging with it with really rudimentary, interfaces, but it's starting to blend. I think true utility will be will be maximized within the metaverse when you can have that blend of how we are used to engaging with the real world through our five senses and touch being a really big one, we think the next big leap forward, we think, from a bias perspective. And then also how you engage virtually, how we were taught to use digital interfaces to date, the keyboard, the mouse, GUIs. These are all really old uh, interfaces of the past, but will be still relevant for some period of time. And how we think about design and optimizing for good, and even just optimizing for usability period, is the whole concept of design thinking in Maya, the most advanced yet acceptable. And when you start to see phase, shift, phase shifts in the past 200 years, 100 years, any time in history, there's always been this really advanced new technology, but it's had to adapt and be packaged as such to where it could be adopted by someone without much training. We're building a product for consumers. We're not building a product for uh, manufacturing workers. If we were, you could, you could withstand a ton of training and manuals and know-how, but we're really interested in what happens in the consumer space because that's where we believe we can have the biggest impact. So yes, I do think that we have the opportunity to bridge some of the gap to make, to be honest, uh, things feel a little bit more human because when you're too disconnected from the other, when you're too disconnected from reality, then really bad things can happen. And we hope that we can achieve some of that. Um, we're not naive to think that it's automatically going to happen because when you have that mindset, you see what happens in the latest, you know, web, web 2.0, social media 2.0. And so 
we're being very thoughtful about how powerful this new data stream is of touch, privacy, user uh, data as well. Uh, that, that's, you know, I, those are some important points because you talked about realism. I mean, on this call, if uh, the fact that I can say Andrea and there's a furniture in his house and I can see the expressions on Paul's face and so on, a lot of the things could get disintermediated in a metaverse version with highly cartoonized, highly mm. avatarized, uh, and so on. That takes us away from reality. And this, you know, partial sense of, you know, a tangible bits that we can, tangible photons uh, that we can that we can share still keeps us kind of somewhat somewhat grounded real, in a way, yes. somewhat grounded, somewhat anchored. So, so you know, those are some of the unintended consequences one can worry when things are mostly virtual. Uh, John Paul, what what are your thoughts on on on, on these and where where is, where is five G going with where it could go in the next five to ten years to make some you know amazing imp- positive impact on society beyond the obvious applications of higher speed and and more privatized communication. We are seeing 5G going in the direction that more and more people will be able to implement it by themselves and more and on the private side, which means uh, you don't have 5G somewhere. You put a box, you turn it on, it connects to satellite like Starlink and you get 5G for the village or in case of a recovery mission in some accidental area. So it will become like very easy. And the other part we see is that um, managing big networks of 5G base station, that's for public operators, will use more and more AI so that you don't need to do as much radio planning and every base station becomes a self-adaptive box which reconfigures uh, to the radio requirements based on who is using it at what time. So we see those two directions. We also see something... so, so, so Jawal, you're saying that as communities become self-sufficient in terms of communication, uh, Self- that could, un- that could yes. unleash, uh, you know, a, a whole new revolution. People could start moving to areas that are far away from uh, technology or business hubs. Uh, you could see uh, jobs uh, being more yes. democratically available in remote areas. Uh, yeah. This, uh, this uh, move away from cities could make it more sustainable in terms of access to water and uh, and other resources. Uh, so you and see, you see, five G, the self-sufficient five G boxes as kind of an enabler to this uh, societal trend. Yes, because those boxes will be happening where people need them and where they are ready to invest by themselves. And what we've seen also is that the more five G there is in a country, like see, for example, Japan or Korea, the more developed is the industry. So the fact that everybody can actually uh, purchase a 5G box and set it up anywhere is uh, will have good impact for jobs, industry, and development. Fascinating. Satya and then Andrea, I know we're running out of time, so 30 30 seconds each. I just want to say on question number two, how can we increase the likelihood for a positive social impact of such technologies? The short answer is, Focus on Agenda 2030, which are the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. If you intentionally focus on how your technology can advance and achieve the Sustainable Development Goals, you will be a long way toward assuring that technology is, in fact, in the global public interest. I mean, that's such a great session. I mean, maybe for us, it should come out with a pledge that says, you know, every major technology company should have a checklist on those development goals of, of, of 2030. Wonderful solution, Satya. Andrea? Thank you. No, I am. Again, I take the, I take the cue from Jean-Paul when he's talking about this um, 5G, 5G, pers- let's call it 5G private mobile boxes. They, have a, they can have a lot of great use, but they might have, a, for instance, maybe used for fishing, for fishing data from uh, mobile phones where people think are connected to a um, are connected to, um, to, a, to a mobile operator, then in reality it will be connected to a private um, to a private station which is fishing their data. So this is this is always interesting to see how something that can be used for um, for positive developments can be used for negative 
prerogative uses. So this is bring us always to the question that in the end, technology is not good or bad. It's just the people using them that makes it good or bad. And is a role of the and again is is a role of the is a role of the government and of society try to try to try to make it develop in a positive framework. Yeah. I mean, I mean the pushback to that, right? We have heard is that I think in the 80s and 90s, the fact that you're building technology for society was good enough. And the the the, the assumption was if you do good technology, good things will mostly happen. But over the last 10 or 20 years, we have seen, you know, the fact that the moment the technology becomes mass use, you know, there's a pushback. So Satya, to your point, you know, your earlier point you made about having some design principles, and now your point about, you know, having a checklist for sustainable goals uh, is, a, is a really good start. So that would be my push to, pushback, uh, Andrea. But let's let's hear from Chris. I, I if I, sorry if I, if I, if, no, it's something that came to my mind when we were talking. It's, uh, I am almost, uh, almost, almost 50 years old now. So I've, I've seen, uh, I've seen a few technologies coming up and come not if it's coming. I think that I don't know if somebody ever did like a model of this, but usually what happens is technology when they are when they are emerging, everybody is very optimistic. So technology emerging technology is good. When it gets mature, people starts uh, gets mainstream. People start getting worried, you know, and say this is bad. They cannot you know, remember mobile phones. They were saying they would create cancer. So it's uh, everybody try to imagine all kind of bad things about technology. Then once they become mature, basically they become invisible and nobody talks about them and takes them for granted. Fantastic. With that, I would like to formally conclude our session. And you're welcome Sorry. to stay on uh, to chat. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry Thank you, you very much. So we, we can stay on for a minute if you want. I'm just going to stop streaming. <laughs>